All right, we are live. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of ACFO Presents Webinar Wednesdays. Apologize for the delay. We're having a few technical difficulties. As like you, we are working from home and sometimes we have a little glitches. Um, very happy to be with you today. Uh, we have a very special guest, Kevin Page, who should be joining us uh, later on the webinar. Again, we're trying to connect with them a little bit of technical difficulties. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to give you an update on COVID-19. So again, uh, I am Danny Richard, ACFO president. Um, in light of COVID-19, we decided to do more of these webinars because uh, you guys are self-isolating. We don't have the usual firewalls that we have uh, when you're connecting through your work networks. An update on COVID-19. So uh, the biggest thing right now that's happening is the discussion about the eventual return to work. So there's no date that has been set. And to be frank with you, I believe most departments will be returning gradually on different dates, depending on the nature of their work, their region, uh, the mission statement from their deputy heads. So not everyone will be returning to work at the same time. The biggest thing for us is how this will happen. So we want to ensure that your safety is not put into play. Uh, we want to make sure that there's proper protocol in terms of cleanliness so that if you're you know, sharing an office right now with hoteling and an uh, activity-based workplace, it uh, wasn't never designed for this type of, of pandemic. So our biggest priority is that, is it done safe? The good news for most of our members is that we don't necessarily need to be physically in the office to go back to work. So we're discussing now with Okro, that's the Office of Chief Human Resources Officer, to, to discuss how this return to work will happen. It is uh, uh, difficult because different departments have different priorities, but we are have, taking part in the conversation. If you have any specific concerns about your eventual return to work, please contact us at ACFO. We received a lot of good questions from members that said, well, what about this? Do, do, can I refuse to go back to work if I don't feel it's safe? So uh, we addressed this in our past webinar Wednesday. So feel free to go on our uh, ACFO page. You can see all our past webinars that discuss as well the uh, uh, all the questions we received in the past. Um, so that's where we stand right now. Uh, for today's episode, what we wanted to do is, is one of the questions we received was in light of COVID-19, What's the economic outlook going to look like? And it's very difficult to actually put numbers on this. So we decided to invite Kevin Page and we're still trying to connect with him right now. But I'm going to give you maybe uh, a little bit more about Kevin Page. He's, he's really, uh, and I don't want to underplay this, he's a big deal, uh, especially for us as financial professionals. So Kevin, for those who are not familiar, is the was the first appointed parliamentary budget officer. So let me get his background. He spent his whole career in the federal public sector. He worked in many different departments. Uh, and then uh, when he was got to the ranks of higher uh, management, he uh, you know, was working at Treasury Board. He was working for Privy Council Office. He did a lot of, he occupied a lot of positions that allowed him to have access to the senior ranking officers. And he was giving advice basically to the prime minister's office, which you don't get any higher than that. So because of that, when the position of uh, PBO was created in 2008, he was appointed by Stephen Harper to, uh, I mean, he had to qualify for the job, obviously, but he was, the, he was the guy, he got the job and it was a five year term. And he actually wrote a book. He wrote this book, uh, it's called Unaccountable Truth and Lies on Parliament Hill, which I encourage any of our members to pick this book up. And I'll tell you why it's specifically relevant to us. Um, Often we see decisions that are made, made that don't make any sense to us, right? Uh, and I can tell you why that is most days, most of the time is because it's driven by politics. If there's something that Kevin is able to highlight in his book is that although his job was to challenge the government's number, he was an independent arm of the government, he wasn't able to do his job because there was political inter interference. So I'll give you examples of this. In his book, he describes how when D&D was costing the F-35 fighter jets, um, he basically told D&D, I believe you guys are purposely under forecasting the numbers. So they weren't being fully transparent in what the true cost was. And he called out the government on this. Needless to say, he was not making any friends in the process because when you're challenging departments saying, you know what, I think you're grossly and purposely underestimating your numbers, 
uh, they probably won't like you. But he went even further because this was his job. He was appointed to do this. So he and his team, another example was draft. So 2012-ish, when there was a deficit reduction action plan, uh, a lot of departments were saying, hey, I'm going to save 1.5% at a high level, and that's it. And Kevin and his team went and looked at these numbers and said, hey, I see this is your savings, but can you give me the granular details? I just want to make sure the numbers are good. And he pointed out in his book, the numbers did not add up. And that's why it's so relevant for us because sometimes we won't understand what's going on. We're saying, why are these decisions being made? Like they're, they're hiding the truth because everything is being drived by politics. So I have tremendous respect for Kevin Page. Uh, I mean, he's, he's not only uh, uh, someone to look up to, but we work with Kevin and his team to provide courses for our members. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, but now Kevin has moved on. So he worked five years as PBO, he has a five year term. And at the end of it, he was basically told, thanks, but uh, we're done with you now. And again, he did a great job at it. So he's moved on now to the University of Ottawa where he works at IFSD. That's the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy. IFSD is a, it's a non-for-profit organization that looks at fiscal policies and says, okay, does this make sense, right? They're basically a think tank. Uh, him and his team uh, uh, know what they're talking about, but more importantly, they're independent. So they're not politically driven. They just say, look, do the numbers add up? Do they make sense? And because of his knowledge, his experience, and, and for most of all, important for me is integrity, we teamed up with IFSD and we offer courses now. So the, the one, the most popular one uh, was called IFSD uh, 360, where our members get to see over a five day period how a political platform is created up into the public accounts. And then you can see that, how do you follow the money? And it is very, very high level. In fact, it is so high level that sometimes our members have said on day one, I'm not sure why you're talking about this. Like I get what you're saying, but this doesn't apply to my day to day. But by the end of day five, you slowly start to connect the dots and realize, oh, now I know my sometimes decisions are made that don't make sense to me, but they're politically driven. So that's why you should always read your minister's mandate letter. You should always, uh, I see Kevin has joined us. Hi, Kevin. I'll get to you in just one second. Thanks. Um, uh, you should always be aware of your, your, your organization's business plan is because that's what your DMs are looking at. That's what your CFO is looking at. So you want to make sure that you are aware of their mindset so that you can understand how you can add value to them because we are in the weeds, that's what we do. And that's why we like to team up with Kevin and his team because Kevin once said this to me and I love that. He says, you know what, what his purpose is, is to create the next generation of leaders and our members are the next generation of leaders. So I see Kevin is online now. Maybe just say uh, welcome to the, uh, the episode, Kevin. Maybe just a quick hello. Hello, Kevin, thank you for joining us. There he is. Hi, Danny, sorry, sorry for the, the confusion. Hey, no, no problem at all, my friend. Uh, this is on our part as well. So, so you know, we're, we're very pleased to have Kevin here to maybe give us his thoughts on the economic outlook, how that will, will proceed moving forward. Uh, we had the questions for our members. And again, as good as Kevin is, you know, him and his team, he's an economist. Uh, uh, it's not perfect, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want one of our members to say, oh, Kevin Page said this and it didn't happen. No, this is just basically his best guesstimate of how he thinks happening. So maybe Kevin, I'll hand it over to you and you can go through your presentation. And I think uh, your slides are showing on the screen right now as well. Oh, sorry, yes. Kevin, my apologies. Before I pass it over to you, I forgot Slido. Really sorry about that. Uh, Joe, perhaps we could put Slido on the screen so members can know how to ask questions. So uh, Kevin's going to give his presentation. And if you want to ask questions, you can go to Slido. So Slido's on the screen right now. So if you go to Slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com. And uh, it's going to ask you for a code. And the code is ACFO, ACAF. And you can see how right now people are asking questions. So we can get to those questions once uh, Kevin is uh, done with his presentation. So that's how it works. Slido.com and the code is ACFO, ACAF. And we'll take the questions at the end. Kevin, sorry to interrupt. Over to you, my friend. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, uh, thank you as well, Joe. Sorry for the uh, the delay and for me getting properly connected. I really, I think it's, it was my fault. So again, I have a brief presentation. I think I would like to make it even briefer. My sense is there's going to be a lot of questions and uh, because there is a lot of questions in terms of like where, you know, what's likely to happen to the economy. What does history tell us? Uh, how useful is history? What is, you know, are we, how are we going to deal with all this debt that the government's going to accumulate? Um, 
And what does this really mean for the public service kind of going forward from, uh, are we gonna see austerity? Are we gonna change the way we work? Uh, there's, there's just so many good questions. So like in this short presentation, I, I have, um, I, I spent a little bit of time, a few slides just kind of going through the virus. Cause again, this is really why we uh, have, we're in this sort of lockdown mode. I, I'd like to skip through that really quickly. Um, yeah, just, you know, maybe not this. Uh, yeah, the first slide, thanks, Joe, was really just, again, what this virus is. So it's a coronavirus. Uh, you know, we've seen other versions of this type of virus in the past, but they were epidemics. They were not pandemics. And I think really what makes this virus uh, so difficult to deal with is just, it's it just seems to be so transmissible. And, you know, much more so than, you know, some of the SARS or MERS, which are acronyms for other coronaviruses that we've experienced in the past couple of decades. Like this one went global in a hurry and like it still, you know, has a lot of epidemiologists scratching their heads. Um, and, I, you know, the bottom point here is that, you know, the, the virus has not mutated, but like there's definitely a lot of work going on uh, by epidemiologists to see if it is in fact mutating. There was even reports out today in newspapers suggesting that it may have and they're following certain strains. Why that would be important? Because it could really uh, complicate and prolong uh, this uh, public health crisis. It could you know, draw questions whether for people that are trying to develop um, treatments or uh, vaccines, it just, it makes it that much more complicated. And like right now we have a sense of who is really vulnerable. If it does mutate, it may change who is vulnerable. So like really the, why we're here, like why we're talking, why we're at home, it's because of this public health crisis. And so it, I just thought it was reasonable to start there, but I'll go quickly through some of these slides and get to the economy. Thank you. So yeah, there's these standard curves, which are kind of nice graphic pictorials about uh, what this, you know, these um, infection rate curves, uh, late, what they look like under normal circumstances, if you're not taking containment measures or if there's no vaccine. And they just have this, you know, very common shape and like you could overlay this pretty much for the world in some ways, like the investigation phase, if you had to go back to where we were in December or January, uh, and particularly in China, Wuhan, and um, that was really more the investigation of the outbreaks. Recognition initiation for a lot of countries was sort of January, February timeframes. When you look at data in Canada and other places, like the acceleration was really taking place through March. And because of a lot of containment measures, like we we didn't we didn't really have this peak, right? So, you know, when people talk about flattening the curve, this is the curve that they're looking at, and uh, so we it, you know we haven't really had that sort of shape. Uh, but I'll show you. And then there's a decelerating phase and a resolution phase. And a lot of these things, these curves, they work for like all kinds of things, like influenzas, et cetera. So they're pretty common way for scientists, epidemiologists to kind of look at this, you know, this issue. Um, yeah, but of course, underneath this is, you know, are people that are getting infected and, uh, you know, a lot of families are losing, you know, loved ones around the world, particularly seniors, uh, you know, particularly parents and grandparents. Thanks, Joe. We go to the next slide. Yeah, you, you're not going to be able to, you know, you can, the cool, not the cool thing, there's nothing cool about uh, COVID-19, but, you know, you have, we have access to a lot of newspapers and almost all the major media outlets make available COVID-19 analysis for free. So anybody can go to Financial Times or New York Times or The Atlantic or whatever the favorite magazine is and just read for free, like they're kind of, you know, their research, how they're covering this. So there's all kinds of charts and graphs. But again, yeah, when you kind of plot it out, and uh, you know, you know these uh, infection kind of curves. You know, they, you and you probably have seen something like this. So, yeah, and these numbers change daily. So, if I did this a couple of days ago, put this PowerPoint together, and send it over to Joe and Danny, like the numbers are already quite a bit bigger. But you know, a few days ago, we have we're dealing with 3.4 million cases. Again, this all started with a case or two you know, in in Wuhan in December, in China, and now you know we're dealing with you know. I think it says here 231,000 deaths. I thought I saw a number this morning. It's like 250,000, but it's the nature of these things. You can definitely see some countries on these curves that like the United States that uh, have been quite infected. And again, people, a lot of us have watched um, NBC or CNN, like we get inundated with this sort of information. The U.S. is really struggling. Certain states like New York are as really struggling, turning things around a little bit. But, you know, buried in the middle of all that sort of spaghetti lines is Canada. 
which is so we're a little bit better than a lot of our, our partners and certainly a lot better than the United States in terms of dealing with infections. But, you know, at the bottom end of it, there's countries that um, had, you know, had quite a bit of success, New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, you know, even China was able through a lot of containment measures, able to flatten these numbers. So if we go to the next slide, Joe. Yeah, just some quick numbers in Canada. Again, these numbers change uh, um, daily. So, you know, what's important here, like you, you get a sense of how many people we've tested, you know, uh, a little bit less than a million people Canadians have been tested. We're probably really close to around 4,000 deaths now. Um, yeah, so yeah, again, through the, and this is, you know, after a lot of work by you good folks staying at home, uh, and a lot of work by public health officials, those frontline people trying to keep us out of harm's way. Next slide, Joe. So yeah, then you look at sort of just Canada's numbers. And again, you can kind of see a, the essence of a bit of that epi curve. So again, if you go to the far left-hand side of that graph, you're kind of early March, like it was almost, you, you, you'd you really be asking yourself, what are people talking about? There are really no numbers in Canada. Why are we worried about this? Then you start to see the acceleration kind of later in March and, you know, kind of last, um, you know, well into April. And then you start to see a little bit of flattening in terms of the number of new cases. And so, and it's been pretty, so there's still growth. There's still outbreaks in different parts of the country. Uh, we're still adding, you know, you know, 1500 plus new cases every day. And again, these are the cases that are get reported by public health officials. And of course, there are a lot of cases that we, we don't know about. Um, but yeah, again, one of the things with, you know, that adds a lot of complexity to dealing with these issues is it's just the shapes of these things that they're, for the most part, they're not really linear. Like when you're in that acceleration point that uh, it really creates a lot of panic, certainly by public health officials, but financial markets as well. So next slide, Joe. Yeah, so then you can, you know, there's all kinds of information. You can go to any number of places, including the COVID-19 uh, what, you know, site up on the Governor of Canada. Um, and you can see like where are the breakdowns by provinces. And you know, you can quickly see um, that uh, obviously a lot of infections in Ontario and Quebec. Um, some recent spikes that people have been talking about in, in Nova Scotia uh, and Alberta as well. So um, yeah, unfortunately Quebec seems to be particularly hard hit. So if we go to the next slide, now we're really more into the economic stuff, the economic part of this presentation. And I think the, um, like just you know, again, when, when people talk about like, this, what was the strategy of governments to deal with uh, this uh, public health crisis? And effectively, like, you know, this economy, the couple of economists that have written, actually, I would almost recommend if you're looking for literature and you want it's free literature, if you go to something called Evox, and uh, there's you know a couple of ebooks that are you know that are put up there. They're free. You can just download. There are all kinds of experts around the world. The chapters are one, two, three, four pages, no more than that. And you know they kind of talk about different aspects of uh, how uh, countries are, in, are dealing with um, the virus. So you know so this is really a quote: efforts to flatten the epi curve, that epidemiological curve, the infection curve, reduce economic activity. So obviously containment, social distancing, you're shutting things down. You're telling people to stay at home. You're shutting down particularly like large retail restaurants, hospitality sectors, you know, airline industries. Uh, you know, really in some weeks we've pretty much, we flattened major parts of the economy down. So like basically what we're saying here is the recession is almost a public health measure. We're really driving the economy into a recession by, you know, just telling people to stay at home, don't spend money. Uh, we're, you know, we're, it's really almost like we're, it's a, a kind of a, a, a response to deal with this public health crisis, which is a little bit of unusual. Like you have to go back uh, maybe early 1980s where people thought inflation was a major problem that uh, we really, you know, the central bankers at the time were dramatically rose interest rates. They drove the economy to recession really to kill demand pressures to kill inflation. So here now we're, we have a public health crisis. We have a spread of this coronavirus and we're saying we got to shut down the economy. Uh, we got to, you know, we got to practice social distancing and we're going to drive the economy to a recession just to deal with the public health crisis. So next slide. So people, when they talk about these curves, like this is, you know, kind of a, um, just, you know, some simple graphics that, you know, what I think at the back of policymakers' minds, what they're trying to deal with, like on the left side is that pandemic curve. So 
like you have the standard uh, epi curve, so to speak, you know, the kind of orange curve. And, you know, without public health measures, you get this big spike. Well, we, you know, thank you to a lot of containment measures and the good work of public health officials in Canada and around the world. Like we really flatten that curve. Um, so that's, you know, and then on the other side, on figure two, like we have the flattening of the recession curve. We're going to get into a little bit just how deep this recession is and what the recovery can look like. But, you know, the governments are basically unloaded everything they have in terms of their arsenal, uh, uh, fiscal supports, monetary policy supports, liquidity supports in order to flatten that curve, just to ease the pains with the hope that once we kind of open up the economy, we take this economy that we put in the freezer uh, a number of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, that once we take it out of the freezer, actually, it'll be, you know, it'll be ready to go. And... Um, so that remains to be seen, like how much these fiscal supports, which are historic in nature, we'll talk a little bit about that, like how much will they really, you know, impact this economic outlook. So, Joe, if we go to the next slide and thank you, Joe. So like there's really the way a lot of people look at this, this pandemic is it's, it's one pandemic, but it's kind of three economic shocks or three big shocks to, to the global uh, economy, to Canada's economy. One, it's medical. So, um, you know, it's, I mean, we're dealing with this public health crisis. You know, we've had already 4,000 people in the neighborhood of 4,000 people passed away a lot. Obviously, much higher number of people have been infected. You get six workers. That by alone is a shock. You know, a, a public health virus, of course, if we would have let this go without containment measures, it would have been a much more serious shock to just, you know, the supply of the economy of healthy workers. So, like in a sense, if when we stay home, we practice social distancing. Like we're, we, you know, we are there, ready. We're some, we we're able to work, maybe not at full productivity, um, because we don't have access to all, you know, the tools, the people that we would prefer to have access to. It's not as readily available, but we're still, we're ready to go when the economy you know, uh, is opened up. The economic shock is really, it's almost like a double whammy. One is the containment part. So, you know, we're by shutting down major sectors of the economy that uh, we have impacted both supply and demand. So we are like we've seen, um, you know, just and I'm going to show you a few slides on what the early labor market numbers kind of look like. So and the other part of this economic shock is really commodity prices. So this started almost about the same time as we were moving up. That's accelerating to the epi curve. Uh, there were efforts uh, by some countries, Saudi Arabia, Russia, to actually lower oil prices, kind of a geopolitical move to kind of have, you know, impact basically, you know, the, the supply uh, of uh, higher cost oil, including uh, uh, fracting kind of, you know, related oil, oil in, in the Canadian market as well. This really drove down prices. And then on top of that, you have this major drop off in demand. So oil prices are, um, they just, they plummeted as um, you all know, when you go from time to time, you go to the pump. And then, you know, finally, the third shock is just the confidence and uncertainty. Like you just, as we all know, when we go out to stores, like people are in a state of fear um, and um, people are worried about their futures. You know, financial markets are incredibly volatile right now. They're kind of picking up on that. And uh, so, like, there's just this big question, like, what is the post-COVID uh, pandemic economy? What is it going to look like? And so there's, and there's not, you know, notwithstanding the fact that the people are, have, there's a lot of faith and trust in, in the work that's being done by public health officials and governments in many parts of the world. There's just a huge amount of uncertainty. That, are we going to go back to a 100% economy? Is it going to be a 90% economy, an 80% economy, a 70% economy? When, you know, you know, when will it, you know, is there, when will we come to some kind of new normal? Is it when we get the vaccine? Is it a couple of years from now? And even then, uh, what does that look like? So if we kind of continue to go through, Joe, the next slide. Yeah, so like, and people also look at, you know, this global economic shock in terms of a number of phases. And one is just the China shock, it's where it started. Um, and now, um, yeah, it's so you know by that it's not putting blame on China, but that's where it did started. And China is you know it's is the better part of twenty percent of the world economy. It is a massive producer of intermediate goods for a whole range of things. So like once China goes into lockdown mode early on, it's sort of in a, a kind of December, January, February, and still in some lockdown measures. 
that it has an impact on the entire global economy just by the sheer weight of this economy, of the Chinese economy. Then you get to all these various sectors that get impacted. Uh, some through various containment measures, and you know, some you know because just travel stuff it, it gets disrupted, or there are supply chain you know kind of issues, uh, some of which we hear about in the news because it's related to the health sector in particular, and, and but others that you know that are supply chain related, we're going to worry about in the years ahead. Then as we go through, like you know, most countries of the world, advanced economies, quote unquote, have used uh, you know just major shutdowns. Uh, lockdowns of the economy. So then you get in these acute overall disruptions. This is kind of the March, April period. Then there's the question like, when is the recovery? You know, so when do we start opening things up? And we're having these conversations right now on the recovery. So they're like, we're talking in you know, most parts of the world are talking about different phases. Uh, analysis is taking place. I saw an interesting piece in the New York Times this morning that really looks at you know, what areas, particularly in the retail sales area, are more, you know, create more vulnerabilities for infection than others. And so, like, this is almost a science now. Like, how do you keep people safe and yet start opening up, particularly a lot of the service sector? And I'll just, like, pause on this point just to say that um, this is very different than, say, the 2008-9 financial crisis, where uh, it hit the good sector particularly hard. Like going into this crisis, it, it was really the service sector that got hit extremely hard, particularly through that, you know, that phase three acute overall disruptions. We shut down those face-to-face -face interactions, and that's a you know big part. Sixty percent of our economy is the service sector, so it got walloped starting in sort of you know mid to late March. So, Joe, if we go to the next slide, thanks, Joe. Yeah. So I and again, you can't, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but so people all. It's, People like myself and some of my colleagues, we're looking at, you know, where are people think the economy is going to go? And so that's kind of, that is, and so what are the numbers right now? And so the International Monetary Fund, they employ all kinds of people that kind of provide, you know, this sort of economic analysis forecasting for around the world. They put out their, you know, their spring uh, global economic outlook, you know, a number of weeks ago, not too many weeks ago. And so they really started to say like, the global economy is going to shrink in 2020, they say by 3%, real GDP. So again, what does that really mean? Doesn't sound like a really big number, but it, it, like in the financial crisis in 2008-9, it was flat. We didn't actually shrink. Advanced economies shrunk, but the, you know, you know, the emerging market, developing economies, they continued to grow. And so we overall was kind of a wash, flatline, growth flatline, but not shrink. Now they're talking about IMF, about a 3% reduction, and then a bit of a snapback in 2021. You know, for advanced economies, like they say, it's a much steeper decline. Again, service sectors are incredibly disruptive. And uh, so you can see like that number is about 6.1% decline uh, in, in advanced economies. For Canada, they said roughly, yeah, roughly an average decline and then a bit of a snapback. And so, yeah, so that's a kind of, these are numbers. This is a re just, and my guess is that these numbers are going to get worse. Uh, as uh, we continue to struggle with the, the, the public health crisis. If we go to the next slide, Joe. So again, people talk, what does this mean for government debt? Well, these numbers are moving big time. And uh, they moved in as well and significantly for many countries in the 2008-9 financial crisis, which is not shown on this table. But if you look at like uh, advanced economies, you know, their debt to GDP ratios, uh, general government debt. This is like total economy debt on a net basis, which means gross liabilities, less financial assets. 2019 sitting kind of around 76, 77 percent, going to kind of 94 percent. Like in Canada, what you see right away when you compare us with averages, like our net debt numbers, again, you know, they look actually terrific. Like we're, you know, we're going into 2019, our debt was around 25, 26 percent. It's going to skyrocket. It's a very big increase uh, and certainly an average increase going to, you know, they say over to 40 percent. Of course, PBO says the number is going to go much higher because the recession is going to be deeper. And, you know, IMF, everybody, because measures get announced literally every single day. There was an announcement yesterday for the agricultural sector. There's announcements almost every day. The size of the policy package is getting bigger. So, Joe, if we go forward, yeah, so sort of these growth numbers, again, I guess what we're going to see, and you folks are going to live it, we're going to see a decline in the second quarter that even our great-grandparents didn't experience in the 1930s in terms of a decline in real GDP. 
And um, you know, notwithstanding a huge number of supports, including wage subsidy programs, uh, we're going to see a skyrocketing of unemployment rates. We'll have unemployment rates that probably I haven't seen in my lifetime. When I started Department of Finance, we're probably you know north of like in the 13% range. There was a recession in the early 80s, but you know, again, we we kind of got used to having unemployment rates in the five and a half, six percent range. Slightly different demographic, different economy now. So we're like, we're likely to see unemployment rates probably in the 15% range very soon, and then hopefully come back down. So again, in this environment, no one can predict the future. So it's all about developing certain scenarios. And what I think the, the trend seems to be in these numbers is, you know, the drop off in the second quarter, April, May, June, is get, gets stronger, it gets weaker and weaker. And just as, as more and more data comes in. If you go to the next slide, Joe, so then you can see like, you know, we have some limited information. I see, I think a lot of government departments are doing terrific work and StatCan is actually one of them. You can, they're like producing uh, various, like they're making adjustments to various surveys. This is, you know, uh, this is the labor force survey from March. It came out a few weeks ago. You can see that drop off in employment numbers on the left-hand side. You, you see we're wiping off, we wiped off like a million jobs uh, literally in weeks. And you know, again, you can see on a base of about 18 million, that would take us, you know, that way, all the job gains, you know, literally that we had made for almost since the Liberals came in in 2015, it disappeared literally in weeks. Um, and again, on the total hours work, which is something a lot of economists focus on, it's a bit hard to see in this graph because it really just, it just plummets straight down. You get the same thing. You go back to, you know, total hours worked in the economy. You, you have to go back to almost the 2008 financial crisis to get back to this level of hours work. So if we go forward, uh, Joe, again, on fiscally, what does this mean? Well, I mean, again, PBO is now saying we're going to see, we can see deficits of uh, $250 billion, which would be roughly about 13% of, uh, of GDP. Again, and you know that includes about 150 billion dollars of um, direct fiscal supports. So again, most of that deficit of 250 billion dollars is the government saying, "Stay at home. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pay you to stay at home, whether you're a household or a business, and I'm going to make sure you get access to as much money as you need through various kinds of cheap loans." And so the government is literally, this is the great lockdown that people talk about. What's interesting for me here is that because interest rates are so incredibly low. That we've never seen in my lifetime. They keep getting lower. They were a record. They got to record lows in 2008 financial crisis through, you know, central banks around the world. And now they're even even lower. They're effectively down in zero in North America. Like the public debt charges, which is on the left side of this um, uh, of this PowerPoint um, slide. Like, you know, they barely move, even though we're adding all this to the stock of debt. That because interest rates are so low. That you know this number, you know the interest on the public debt, which was really almost a killer for finance ministers through the early 80s, through the 80s and early 90s, because interest rates were you know they were much higher, uh, starting in double digits in the early 80s, you know and you know maybe having over the you know 80s early 1990s, but you know the cost of debt, you know the carrying cost of debt rather, the interest cost relative to revenues was just it, it just it soaked up all you know a huge amount of budgetary revenue. So early 19 90s, you know, for every revenue dollar coming in, the government was spending 36, 37, 38 cents on public debt interest charges. So now, you know, recently, like in the last year or two, we're down to like seven cents of every revenue dollar was going to public debt interest. So this allows governments to actually do this, keeping these interest rates record, you know, at record lows. Next slide. So public, you know, you know, again, what does this mean for debt to GDP ratios? Well, it's a big step backwards. You know, again, a lot of effort uh, took place in the early, you know, mid 1990s. Prime, at that time, it was a liberal government, Prime Minister Chen, Finance Minister Paul Martin. You know, a lot of pain, including in the public sector, um, but they drove the debt to GDP ratio down. And um, then we kind of kept it really low, even th after the financial crisis. And now it's going to skyrocket. So, you know, we'll, we'll go back to 50%, which is kind of where we were around 2000. So it's a big step backwards. Then the question is, okay, how do you manage that forward? And again, now this really gets into what will this recovery look like? And I think the, the, the you know, I think the general consensus, I'm really closing with this now, is that it will be a weak recovery and it will be, uh, you know, prolonged and protracted. 
I think the more the epidemiologists, you know, stare at these infection rates and curves, the more they get a little bit concerned about an echo effect or a second wave that could come in the fall. Or um, I think so. I think we're going to be practicing s different types of measures of social distancing, which is going to constrain growth and it's going to constrain trade as well. So I think people think this is going to be kind of a weak, you know, economic recovery over the next few years. Like, when do you see light at the end of this tunnel? I think it's when we do get to a vaccine. And so then how fast can the world get to this vaccine? And so then, then you get complete light. Is there intermediate light between now and, say, a vaccine in you know 12 to 18 months? And I, that potentially comes through a lot of testing, a lot of contract tr tracing, which raises a lot of issues for some people, individual liberties, et cetera. But we start to operate in a very different way. So... Basic line, I think nobody really knows what the future is. We know that this recession is extremely painful. Even for people like us that are staying at home, we're dealing with maybe mental health issues, but we're getting paid. There are a lot of people that you know are going to have to get by with you know re reduced but federal supports, but certainly reduced incomes than what they have normally. Um, I think that the multiple phases in terms of bringing the economy back over the next year and a half. Uh, you know, and again, the key question would be, can we use, can we change the way we work through uh, testing, through contract tracing in order to open up more and more of the economy? And then, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, 18 months down the road with a vaccine, like we put COVID-19 in the rearview mirror. But then the bigger question is, like, what kind of economy are we going to have? Like, how, um, what, uh, are, are we going to work in a very different way? Um, are all these industries going to come back, uh, you know, like to 100%? Like, will still, even after a vaccine, will people say, no, I'm still, or will they be comfortable to go on cruise ships? Like, will the tourist industry be as strong? Will people feel the same way of going back to restaurants or going into retail clothing stores the same way? Like, these are all big components of our, our economy. So, again, it doesn't mean to say it, it, it could actually be, we don't know, it could be better. Like, it could, we could adjust in a very different way. Uh, we learn to operate in a different way. Maybe the world comes together and we strengthen our public health care systems, uh, the World Health Organization, and um, we realize, that, yeah, we, we we trade in different ways, but we, so there's just a lot of uncertainty. I don't want to take up more time because I want to leave some time for questions. Thanks, Danny, for being so patient. Thanks, Joe, very much for flipping those slides. Thank you very much, Kevin. Always curious to hear your thoughts. And I, I'm, it reminds me once, I, I heard you say this, that when it comes to forecasting and predicting the future, uh, you think of it as a batting average, right? If you get three out of 10, four out of 10, more than happy. And it's, it's you're, you're dealing with so many variables. It's almost impossible to say. That's why I'd rather trust on, okay, well, what is the data? Where did you, what leads you to this conclusion? Because therefore I can see, all right, do I agree with your assumptions or do I not? And if I don't, I can put in my own number. So thanks for providing all that data. That was great. And, and for those of you that are curious, we will be posting uh, this webinar on our website, uh, on YouTube as well. So you can actually uh, access the slides there as well. We have questions that have come in, Kevin. Um, I'll just remind people how to ask their questions. So again, to view the questions, you go on slido.com. Uh, you put in the Panda code, which is ACFO, ACAF. I see we have a few questions here that are ACFO specific, so I'll address those later. But first, I'll, I'll maybe ask you the, the more popular questions, Kevin. Uh, we have someone asking, as you mentioned, the interest rates have never been this low. Someone is asking, are we anticipating a correction in the Canadian housing market? Which areas and how severe do you see it being? Yeah, inevitably, I think, uh, Danny, there's going to be a correction. Uh, you know, I think it, in it will in, the correction, the size of the correction could be different, different, obviously different markets. I think there's a bit more stability in Ottawa for different reasons than some other towns. Um, but yeah, I think at a, at a minimum, you're going to see, I mean, we see it like in re, as we read newspapers like daily that like, uh, and not just housing, but some of the other sectors, uh, big retail sectors, autos, et cetera, that people are just like, they're not shopping. So like even the sales are just good. They're going to sit there uh, or the potential sales will sit there. Uh, this will kind of lower prices. Um, and so, yeah, I think if you're, you know, you're a potential buyer, if you're a young person looking to buy a house, like you shouldn't be in any hurry right now, like in this sort of market. Like I think, you know, th there's no way that it's very hard to come up with a scenario where new housing prices, existing prices are actually going to go up. They're going to go down. Um, 
I think, yeah, it, it creates like another side of this coin is, you know, there's um, when we talk about federal debt, we kind of often ignore corporate and household debt. There's a lot of household debt. There's a lot of debt tied up into mortgages right now. So you may have bought, you know, one of the one of the reasons that made the 2008 financial crisis so serious was that a lot of mortgages, a lot of houses were under that term underwater, where um, people were were paying interest more on these mortgages, uh, and where the mortgage value was actually a lot higher than the the current market price of the house. So there is going to be a correction. I think it wouldn't. I mean. From, we look back if we see some positive corrections without too much you know household income damage in places like vancouver and toronto not, not necessarily a bad thing but yeah i think in ottawa definitely I, I can't see housing price increases for some time now thanks kevin uh the next most popular question here is regarding wage freezes and you went through this when you're pbo question is do you think that the government will freeze or even roll back wages for public servants do you think uh, freeze roll back on PMDM salaries like New Zealand, maybe? Yeah, I think this is a good question. I certainly, I lived through it as a public servant in the 1990s when uh, when um, Prime Minister Craig Chan, Finance Minister Paul Martin, they realized that we you know we had to deal with our high debt, uh, um, and we were at the risk was that we're going to lose our credit rating. Again, like in this current context, like the increases in debt. Are um, like you know, Canada is still going to be our debt to GDP ratios are still going to be less than half of what other advanced economies. I don't think there's any short-term pressure from bond rating agencies to actually put you know pressure governments into austerity programs. Having said that, will some political would some you know, political you know is it possible that our political leaders would say that uh, there's just a lot of pain for fairness issues that we're going to have to have some cutbacks in the public service. Um, in, in, the, in the way of wages um, and, uh, and, you know, in the kind of leadership that you talked about, Danny, that we saw or, or in New Zealand. I think like that is possible, but I don't think it's necessarily driven just from financial reasons. The, the, you know, if we, the government was to go into an austerity, an austerity trajectory in the next couple of years, I think it would be a big mistake. I mean, the economy is going to be so weak to actually start cutting back government programs, um, you know, public servants and you know, the number of public servants. I'm talking about you know layoffs. That'd be just adding pain to a very weak economic recovery. And so, I, I think like the current government gets it. But you know, is there a risk that the people get shocked by the debt to GDP ratios that skyrocket to fifty percent from thirty percent? Yeah, there's a risk, but there's there's going to be no pressure from markets to do that. Thanks for your thoughts. I, I love these questions are coming in. Uh, you can tell these are potentially people that are in, in finance asking these questions. Uh, any thoughts on the upcoming federal budget? As you can imagine, these are unheard of times and any number the government puts forward, uh, how confident would they even be with these numbers as we keep on putting in new economic measures? So any thoughts on the, uh, the upcoming budget? Yeah, I think, uh, like I find it, um, I really have two minds of this, Danny. Like one, as you said, like I did spend time doing forecasting at finance and the PBO. And I, you know, like again, just I just when we when economists do these forecasts, not all of them, but I would say most of them, like they don't actually pretend that they can actually forecast the future. You know, they're not like you know they don't have crystal balls or you know some mystical kind of. But you know, they just they they want to basically show political people. Like if you assume certain numbers, this is what's going to happen to your finances, revenues and spending, budgetary balances, et cetera. So I think like right now, I think we heard from the prime minister a day or two ago, like it's there's just too much uncertainty for a budget. At the same time, when I go looking around for information, like I'll go to the COVID-19 you know, site, I'll look at the public health site. I see like forecasts of, of deaths, uh, forecasts of an infection rates under different assumptions. So again, massive uncertainty as well for, for health, the public health people, but they're putting out projections in order to kind of, you know, help people understand why we're taking these significant measures, containment measures. And I think, honestly, I think there should be pressure on the federal government to at least put out a fiscal update before uh, the end, uh, before they, if there is a break in June. And, you know, at least, you know, right now we're relying on the PBO in Canada for any kind of fiscal numbers. We've seen nothing from the Department of Finance. And I think probably a budget, maybe, you know, sometime in the fall could be a reasonable timing. I think, we're, again, we I think we're going to need a fiscal strategy for the government. Markets will demand it because, you know, a lot of debt is going to have to be financed. Um, 
And so they're going to know, like, what is the government's fiscal plan to deal with all this debt? It's not a bad thing. So I think, yes, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, but economists, they, you, we can develop different scenarios, different economic assumptions, show people what happens to the balances. But I mean, what is this strategy? Like, are we OK? Maybe we should be OK with a 50 percent debt to GDP ratio. Maybe we should be talking about stimulus come the fall in 2021, like you know, actually putting more money like we did in nine and 10 to stimulate the economy. So maybe debt to GDP ratio has to go even higher. But what is the strategy? And I think they're going to need a fiscal update and a budget to lay that out. So, yeah, I think we should see both of those things before the end of the calendar year. Um, Chad, another question here about the economics. One is, is asking uh, just to get your thoughts on the emergency economic relief plan that, that Trudeau's government announced. What, what do you think? Too much? Too little? I know when you were speaking, for those who don't know, um, uh, Kevin was uh, having a video chat with uh, leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh, last week. And actually, this a similar question came up and to get his thoughts, uh, with the leader. But I'm curious to get, uh, Kevin, your thoughts on, on this package that was done to, uh, to help Canadians. Yeah, it's an it's a, an, an enormous package. So um, again, we're roughly probably a 2.1, 2.2 trillion dollar economy. The direct fiscal supports that the government has kind of announced already is probably higher than 150 billion just for this year. And um, so, and then we have all these what we call them liquidity supports to make sure the credit markets continue to work. People get access to loans. Um, and so those are worth hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, probably five, six hundred billion dollars. It's a large package. And I think it needed to be a large package. When you're talking about declines in GDP of upwards of 20 percent on a quarter to quarter basis, a second quarter, like it, I, I really don't think like you could you can't go small. It would have been such a painful mistake to actually tell people to stay at home and not provide these sort of fiscal supports. So like, I think it's justified. And again, we now we're talking about a much higher level of debt and there's always risk that interest rates will go up in the future, though I think there'll be a lot of pressure from central banks to keep them low. And so this debt will be financed over long periods of time. So, you know, a lot of folks out there probably have kids. They, you know, they're, you know, the governments that, you know, that will be constructing policies in the futures to deal with like future issues around healthcare or, education or climate change they're going to they potentially could be a little bit more constrained so there is there is not zero cost on the other hand like you know what we're dealing with here is human life and that has to take precedence so i think the package is big but it had to be big my guess is it'll probably get a little bit bigger yeah, and, and you know, I'm, I'm I'm definitely not an economic expert, but I, I agree with you, Kevin. Where there is also a cost to, to not acting quickly or not enough, right? And and those are are harder to determine because these are the, the unknowns. But uh, something needed to be done that was unprecedented. So uh, I I definitely see why the government had to act quickly. Uh, pour ceux qui nous écoutent en français, si vous avez des questions en français, sentez vos lives aussi. Uh, I can see all the questions are in English, but if you have French questions, uh, Kevin speaks French as well. Um, uh, and I also see we got a lot of questions here. We might not have a chance to get through them all because I want to make sure we, we get done by, by one o'clock. So make sure you vote up the questions, whichever the most popular are the ones we're taking. So Kevin, our next question is uh, uh, this an interesting one. Will the government start being serious about missing revenues, tax evasion loopholes to manage the deficit, or will they just cut spending uh, like usual? And maybe give you some more uh, details on this one. So we're, whenever we're negotiating our collective agreements, Kevin, Often what we'll hear from the government is, well, we can't afford all this. We don't have the money. We can't increase your wages. And ACFO's uh, response has always been, you know, if only you were to collect a fraction of the loopholes and the tax evasions, you could fund not only the, the collective agreements, but you can fund a, a hell of a lot more. So curious to get your thoughts on the tax evasions. Yeah, I think um, there... That message got through to governments uh, in the last few years leading up to before COVID-19 really hit that um, people were um, quite upset like when they find out you know, all the offshoring that was going on, the like the, the tax evasion and like, just knowing that a lot of Canadians were involved in that as well as, of course, you know, the rest of the world were. And so, you know, taxes were not being collected. There was like definitely pressure on CRA to is estimate like how big is this tax gap. So we know it's in you know it's in the tens of billions of dollars. That like I think in the you know, and then the government started to hire more people at CRA to kind of deal with these issues, these sorts of tax investigations. And then you know international groups, OECD, have actually created kind of collaborative you know efforts to countries working around the world to deal with the, kind of the international aspects of tax evasion. 
So, like, I, I think this comes back in a big way. It, just, it, it probably disappears a little bit right now because everybody's focused on COVID-19. But I think, again, the, the issues of fairness uh, on, on the tax side, you know, the, you know, the need for revenues, I think, yeah, this will be a, a pretty big focus kind of, you know, once we get the other side of COVID-19, probably late 2021, 22. So yeah, it's, um, this doesn't go away. Governments were getting under a lot of political pressure for pre-COVID-19. This comes right back. Thanks, Kevin. Our next question isn't really related to COVID-19, but I think it's still relevant based on your, you know, you spent three decades working for the federal government uh, and our members, as you know, they're, they're dealing finance, they're financial professionals. What, what uh, advice would you have for anyone not starting or mid-career about working for the federal government, knowing that we deal with finance? Yeah, I mean, I just, it, uh, it is, um, well, for a financial person, whether you're an accountant or an economist, um, I, again, I, I work at a university, so I'm with students. Uh, I do a webinar later today with McGill students. I don't think you could actually have like a more interesting time to actually work. And I think, you know, again, one from one from a policy perspective, financial people are involved in constructing these new policies. And uh, and then I think like my sense is that coming out of this crisis, there will be enormous opportunities to do policy reforms. And so financial people will again have to be part of that package. Like, again, already people are talking about like we, as we put in these very, you know, these uh, emergency response benefit programs or wage subsidy programs, like should we start to rethink our social safety nets? And so like, there's going to be a lot of program change, I think, coming out of this. And the, the financial people that work, you know, whether you're supporting programs or whether you're sitting in central agencies, you know, they've got to be part, seeing they're, they're part of the architects of this, this new future. So like, I actually think from a financial person that uh, you're going to be, um, it's a very interesting time and you know, your skill sets, you want to make sure that they're as strong as possible that, so that you can kind of deal with it. And I, I couldn't imagine what it'd be like to be working at, you know, in departments at the Revenue Agency or Service Canada or Central Agencies designing programs literally in, you know, in 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, getting them, and then, you know, launching programs that are going to spend tens and tens of billions of dollars literally in months. So, like, well, I think, they're in big need, financial people. We need financial people. Thanks, Kevin. And just to add on top of that one, a few of our members had asked us in light of COVID-19 and some layoffs, are there jobs at risk? And I said, I could see any context in which you'd be laid off. And now more than ever, you need to have people that can work the numbers, think of scenarios, look at the forecasts, uh, come up with options and plans. And even um, in ACFO submission to the, the budget submission, we said we want to make sure that financial officers, accounting, audits, and whatever you're doing in numbers, you've got to be part of the conversation, like you just said, because too often by the time the people that should be uh, consulted are consulted, the decision's already made. So it's 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 a very interesting time for our members. And so anybody out there working for the jobs, trust me, you're you're, you're going to be running out of job, guaranteed. Uh, our next question, Kevin, uh, will low interest rates continue into the several years and for how long do you think, do you think any chance of us getting negative interest rates in Canada? Yeah, I think low interest rates are going to be here for the foreseeable future. I think there's just um, central banks are going to do everything in there uh, that they can to make sure these interest rates don't go up. And because they would, you know, these debt relative to incomes of different countries are, are, are skyrocketing. Um, in you know most the advanced economies, they're breaking through 100 percent. Again, we're talking about 50 percent in Canada. In places like Japan, it's it's you know it's closer to 250 percent. So when you have that much debt relative to income, you cannot you know really like the worst case scenario would be a spike in interest rates, maybe caused by a lot of inflation. So like there are going to be a lot of inflation watchers going forward. But again, in this economy, when you're talking about like almost like, you know, uh, the PBO is saying a 12% decline in real GDP. Other forecasters are saying it could be like 6, 7, 8% decline in real GDP. You know, there's really, overall, there's not going to be a lot of, you know, inflationary pressure. It's hard to see these interest rates go up. Like, I think the, 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 the current governor about to be changed, Governor of the Bank of Canada, Mr. Paulus, really did not want to go negative. You know, he, for whatever reason, did not see it. Uh, as uh, again, really, I think maybe just taking tools out of his arsenal. He was he reduced his policy rate 
to as low as he thought is possible, which is like 25 basis points. But he said like right there, he said, okay, now we'll focus on other instruments, quantitative easing being one where the government effectively or the central bank will purchase a lot of government debt in order to just take pressure off the financial markets. So again, I think most of the consensus is that these low interest rates are here to stay. It's a game changer. It allows governments to actually provide these large fiscal supports for debt to GDP ratios to go up to ease the pain that's out there economically. So I, I don't see them going up. Is there a risk? There's always risk. Where would it come from? Maybe some, you know, some type of inflation shock. There's going to be some inflation like on food prices, you know, on maybe pharmaceuticals that are more supply chain related. But overall, you know, I think the, the, the real risks on inflation are deflation, which is negative price increases. Thank you, Kevin. Maybe um, I'll take quickly the next question, but Joe, if you could maybe uh, scroll through the questions, I'd like maybe give Kevin a chance to read some of the outstanding questions because we won't have time to go through these. But Kevin, I'll let you read maybe some of these questions while I answer this one and, and you can pick which question you'd like to answer. So the question I received here is ACFO teaming up with CPA Canada to push for one tax declaration for Quebec residents. So uh, maybe some of you are not aware that if you live in Quebec, you have to fill out two uh, income taxes. And uh, uh, I can see where this member is asking for. There's, there's pros and cons of each. So ACFO, uh, because we represent financial professionals, sometimes uh, people will say, well, you must have some tax opinions uh, or, or programs you want to see changed. Um, we will put out some positions, but more often our primary role is to ensure our members' benefits are well negotiated. We take care of your workplace issues, your professional development. So when it comes to tax issues, uh, unless we're asked to by another organization, at least it makes a big difference for all our members, uh, we wouldn't necessarily make it a priority. So the answer to this question is we're not pushing for it, but more than willing to give out our opinion if if, if, if our opinion would matter in, in a big way. We do work with CPE Canada, however, on other things such as professional development. So uh, there's that uh, that question. Kevin, did you see anything there you'd like to, uh, to speak to? Well, these are really hard questions. So uh, <laughs> really, and excellent questions. Like, you know, there's, I'm looking at on the screen now, um, the questions with respect to potential for more industry sector supports, oil airlines. You know, I think, you know, I think governments will get pushed into providing more of these sorts of supports. I was reading something this morning that, you know, the airline industry is losing like 10 billion. Uh, I think it was a month, literally internationally. So, um, because, you know, the, the shutdowns, you know, the oil sector as well, I, again, you know, providing more supports, there's some tough trade-offs there between dealing with climate change versus the you know the economics of of the energy sector and just the adjustment impacts that need to take place um i think coming out of this like there could be a lot of discussion i heard it with that interview with mr singh the ndp leader thinking more about industrial strategies going forward a lot of european economies like they they target sectors that they want to maintain there's a lot there's another question i'll be really quick danny that just on on who pays for all this debt and uh, there's like a lot of people scratching their head, like again, all this debt going up, like how much will central banks put on their balance sheets? What will be left over? What does this mean like for risk premium rates for different countries? How does this affect Canada? I know in Canada, like our debt is sought after. Like we, you know, after the 2008 financial crisis, we've been increasing the stock of debt a couple hundred billion dollars plus. You know, a lot of foreigners wanted to buy our debt, valued in Canadian currency, but they love our debt. It's AAA, it's investment grade. I suspect there'll be more of that in the future. Um, so, um, but still, I mean, there's more and more. These are really tough questions. I'm not smart enough to answer like in most of these questions. They raise other questions for me, Danny. <laughs> well, I certainly thank you for giving your thoughts on this and your input. And uh, I think you guys can understand why we team up with Kevin and his team. You know, they've 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 been through the mechanics of the government. Uh, they 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 know what they're talking about. But even though they're they're not necessarily uh, going to commit to being the experts. They certainly know a lot. So you can see why moving forward, we work with them. We want to develop more courses that our members can attend uh, because they're really at the Institute that what they do there is they can actually provide some, some workshops and courses, not just the theoretical stuff. So uh, thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. Uh, one of the questions that was on the, uh, the, the slide over there was when can we expect the $1 million training fund 
call letter to come out. That should be coming out late next week, hopefully, by the very latest in two weeks or so. And one of those courses is uh, Kevin Page IFSD 360. It's definitely worth applying for. Again, we cover all the costs and you spend get to spend, spend a whole week with Kevin and his team. So thank you again, Kevin, for joining us today. Next week, we're going to be looking at uh, staffing. So please join us webinar next webinar Wednesdays, staffing next week. Until then, friends, stay safe. See you next week. Bye-bye.